Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another uh, colloquium by the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía here in Granada. And uh, today we will have uh, the talk by uh, Professor Dr. Corinne Charbonnel. And she will talk about the multiple stellar population in global clusters, about the properties, origins, and open questions. And Corinne, uh, Professor Corinne will uh, be uh, properly introduced by Dr. Isabel Marquez. Isabel. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, and thanks for being here again uh, in another Severo Choa colloquium. Um, it's a pleasure to have, your, to have you all here, and it's especially a pleasure to have to, to gather with, with us, uh, Professor Corinne Charbonnel. Um, I've, I acknowledge very much uh, her, her accepting, uh, acceptance of our invitation, and I, um, of course, I extend it to uh, an in-person one for the future when, when possible. Uh, Corinne Charbonnel is full professor at the Department of Astronomy of the University of uh, Geneva. Uh, she made her PhD thesis in, in astrophysics and space science at the University Paul Sabatier in uh, Toulouse, in France, in, in 1992. After a brief postdoc in Geneva, in 1984, she put a position at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in the Institut, Institut de Recherche en Astrophysique et Planetology, uh, Université Paul Sabatier. During these years, um, uh, she has been invited researcher in, uh, in a number of uh, different uh, institutes, for instance, uh, the Max Planck Institute uh, for Astrophysics in Gachin in, in Germany, and in the United States of America, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, the Institute for Nuclear Theory in uh, Seattle, and the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. She is author of more than 370 referred pa papers, more than 100 as first authors, including three invited papers in nature and one invited paper in, in science. And all this work has been cited more than 11,000 times, uh, so um, with an H index of 56. M moreover, she has supervised or co-supervised uh, uh, 12 PhD thesis and uh, 12 PhD master thesis and six postdoctoral fellows. Her activity also includes the lead of a dozen scientific projects where she has been the uh, principal investigator and an intense activity as a teacher, both at the University of uh, Paul Sabatier and the University of Geneva. Uh, Corinne Charbonnel was uh, also president of the uh, SF2A, so the French Society of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and also president of the IAU Division G Stars and Star Physics. She has chaired or participated as a member of the Scientific Organizing Committee in more than 20 international conferences, including uh, several IAU symposia. Last but not least, she is involved in public outreach activities. And I'd like to remark that she is the founder and organizer of the Science Cafes with Geneva Women Astronomers in 2019. She is uh, mostly interested in stellar structure, evolution nucleosynthesis, magnetohydrodynamical processes in stars, abundance anomalies in stars and star clusters, as well as formation and evolution of massive star clusters. She has also worked in galactic chemical evolution, primordial nucleosynthesis, production and evolution of light elements, and in planet habitability. Today, as Rene said, she will talk about multiple star populations in global clusters, properties, origins, and other questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Corinne, for being here, and uh, for welcome, and I give you the board. Thank you very much, Isabel, for these kind words. Uh, I would, as I said to Emilio earlier this morning, I would be so happy to be with you in Canada, and I wish you all the best to, to handle this pandemic the best you can, and, and uh, yes, I hope to be, to be with you soon. Okay, so I will, uh, I think I will start sharing my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. Okay, I'm just hiding Zoom for me. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I will talk today uh, about uh, global clusters uh, and the presence of multiple stellar populations. And I will start uh, my talk by uh, reminding you a nice sentence by uh, William Herschel, uh, where he mentioned that globular clusters are probably the most interesting objects in the heavens. 
And uh, so I will try to convince you about that by presenting you why globular clusters are important for astrophysics and cosmology. And he also says that globular clusters are actually little known. And more than 200 years later, actually, you will also see at the end of my talk that although we know a lot about these objects, there are still many open questions uh, that we, we have to, to understand. So let's start about why do we care about globular clusters? We span a little bit uh, different domains in astrophysics. And I will first remind you what is a globular cluster. So it's an individual cluster of stars that contains uh, around uh, 1 million uh, stars, low mass stars. And uh, they are packed in a, in a small volume. Uh, uh, and in principle, they have the same uh, iron abundances, except in some cases that I will describe later on. So for this reason, actually, global clusters, they have been in intensely uh, studied uh, already in the 60s, and they have been the, the fundamental, they have helped building the fundamental concepts of stellar evolution because of their beautiful color magnitude diagram that actually was probing the evolution of stars along this sequence. Uh, for very long, very little was known about uh, the time where the globular clusters were actually young, so uh, hosting uh, massive uh, stars and also some gas. And there has been some clues recently about these, these early phases that I will discuss today. And I will, you will also see that globular clusters, they can be used as nuclear physics laboratories. In addition of that, they can be used to understand the early universe because uh, in the Milky Way, they are very old. They are actually among the oldest objects in the universe. And we see also similarly old globular clusters in local group galaxies. <clears throat> this means that their formation redshift varies be between seven, the end of reionization, and 2.5, the peak in cosmic star formation rate. And uh, they can be actually, in this context, they can, be, they can be eventually some important contributors to the reionization process uh, in high re at high redshift. They are very important also to understand the formation and the evolution of galaxies. They are very bright objects, so they can be seen very far away and that they are actually found in, global, in galaxies of all urban morphologies. And there is actually a ni nice correlation between their number and the vehicle mass of their host dark matter halos. So they can be used, their number can be used as a tracer of the luminous and also the dark matter distribution at very large scale. Their specific frequency depends on the galaxy morphology. So they are also tracers of galaxy-galaxy uh, interactions and measures over, over cosmic time. And we can use them also, this has been done several times uh, already in the, in the, in the 15th, uh, about uh, to, to, to weight the, the, the Milky Way. And actually recently, thanks to Gaia Dia 2, it has been possible by you looking at their kinematics to determine what is the virial mass of the Milky Way. <clears throat> in addition, there are some possible correlations between their property, in particular their age, their metallicity, and their distribution in uh, their position and their orbit. So there is actually some, uh, some uh, strong probability that uh, the metal-rich ones, they are actually mu much more likely to belong to the disk than to the halo. And on the other hand, actually, the most metal-poor ones are probably coming uh, more in the halo, so they are probably coming from, from mergers. So these, uh, their properties probe the early phases of the building of the Milky Way and the different processes that led to the evolution of, of our galaxies. And it's very important also to understand the dynamical history of the, of the local group at all. <clears throat> the, the, the global clusters, actually, I said that they are a large group of, star, of stars, but they also evolve dynamically under different fundamental processes. And they also interact with their environment by different processes. So they will actually uh, spent, they will all actually lose some, uh, some of, their, of their stars. And we can start to see these events actually also with, uh, with, Gaia, with Gaia data. And uh, this leads to the question about what was their initial uh, mass function. There are different studies that show that they can have had uh, uh, an initial uh, mass that can be 10 to 20 times higher than the one we see today. So they are very important uh, also for the, for the contribution to galactic stellar populations. 
One of the questions is if we can relate uh, global clusters to the young massive star that we see today forming in the local group that have actually uh, compactness and masses similar to what we think was the one of the proto-global clusters. And there is also some evidence for on ongoing star formation of very massive clusters by mergers and uh, in starburst galaxies uh, in the local group. There are many, many examples. So one of the big questions, as I was saying, is can we relate these uh, young massive star clusters to the uh, proto-global cluster that formed in the early universe? And of course, this is also an important question for the uh, understanding of galaxy formation and assembly across cosmic time. And uh, uh, this, uh, on top of, of observations, there are actually uh, simulation that actually start to help uh, probing these questions. Uh, now you can you can see in such in simulation like uh, this uh, e uh, mosaic simulation. Actually, you can follow as a function of redshift the presence of these clusters, and you can even distinguish between in situ clusters that form in situ or those that were accreted. So there is a lot of activity going on and a lot of questions, uh, but uh, and it's very important for many topics in astrophysics and eventually also cosmology. But as you will see in my talk, there are still many open questions that uh, indicate that we are far from understanding these objects uh, in detail. Um, so my talk now will, will, uh, will focus on a new pieces of evidence about all these aspects that actually come from uh, the discovery, uh, thanks to, to VLT and, uh, and also to OBOL, of uh, very exceptional abundance anomalies that I will describe now in these global clusters. So this is the second part of, of my talk. So I step back a little bit, a little bit, and I would like to 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 take you to what you find in a, in a classical textbook. If you look in classical textbook and you look for the definition of a global cluster, you will find that it's considered as a, a formed of a single coeval stellar population that were actually born from homogeneous chemical composition. One reason why this was sought is that when you looked at such uh, a nice uh, color magnitude diagram, you, you were seeing that actually the stars are along a very, very, very nice and, and single well-determined sequence. Um, and on top of that, spectroscopic for a long time was available only for bright giants. And uh, it was found that there was actually no internal scatter from star to star in heavy elements like iron, alpha elements, neutron capture, and all the iron peak elements. So it's a clue and this hasn't been actually um, a chance, uh, that there has been no self-enrichment of these clusters, so in situ, by supernovae products or uh, r and S processes. There are some rare exceptions, actually the most massive global clusters like Omega Sen or M22, which I show here, that actually show spread in iron, but these are very exceptional. And again, these are the most massive ones. And actually, Omega Sen is not really considered as a, as a prototype global cluster, but it's more thought to be uh, the remnant of a dwarf galaxy. And this has been also evidenced more recently, thanks to Gaia data by uh, Ibata and collaborators. So um, this, uh, this view actually uh, has been of a single coeval uh, stellar population has been actually challenged by two types of observations. The first one was uh, from uh, this uh, beautiful HST uh, legacy survey of galactic global clusters that was led by uh, uh, Giampaolo Piotto and colleagues in Italy that actually looked at a large number of global clusters in the galaxy using different filters of, uh, of HST. And you can see here on the right, it's the same cluster than the one on the left. The difference is that now you look at the CMD by combining different filters uh, from HST. And you see in particular, when you use filters that are actually sensitive to, to highly sensitive to temperature, which is a proxy for helium, you see some uh, these uh, nice that the single sequence actually splits into multiple sequences. And here these filters indicate that actually the different sequences, the different populations, they span a range in helium. And the observations of different clusters indicate that there is actually a variation in the mass fraction of, of helium, uh, which can be as high as 20% uh, between the different populations. So there is now a new paradigm that actually global clusters, they are not 
hosting a single stellar population, that they actually host multiple stellar population with abundance anomalies. I will give you more details about these abundance anomalies. Uh, there has been also a, a nice uh, different way of uh, a little bit different than the color magnitude diagram, but it's uh, uh, using using combination of, of different filters, there is a way actually to separate the different populations, for example, the green one and the, the, the magenta one that you see here. So this first population and the second population by combining different filters. And here you have an, info, an indication about variation of different elements. And in particular, you can see that in this combination of filters, one see also some variation of, of nitrogen. So helium and nitrogen. And another uh, uh, couple of elements which is varying are actually oxygen and sodium. So here we turn to spectroscopy and you can see uh, uh, a collection of, uh, of uh, abundances of, uh, of oxygen and sodium in individual stars in a large number of, of globular clusters that have metallicities that vary a, a lo uh, along a large range that have different physical pro properties and that belong both to the disk and to the halo. And what you can see is that in all the cluster, there is a dispersion in oxygen and sodium. And on top of that, here on the right, you can see the uh, abundances of oxygen and sodium that you see in field stars with the same, uh, same metallicity. And you see that in all the clusters, actually, you see a, a first population of star that has the same abundances in oxygen and sodium than uh, the halo stars, which indicates that this first population actually formed out of original globular cluster of original globular cluster material. That was the composition of the material out of which the globular cluster formed. So similar to field stars. But on top, you see that in all the cluster, there is a second population, which is enriched in sodium and depleted in oxygen. And we see this anticorrelation in all the clusters. There is a difference in shape and extension of this anticorrelation. And I will show you that actually this depends on the globular cluster properties. So I will insist a little bit about this anticorrelation because it's really fundamental. It has been seen in all the globular clusters in the Milky Way where it has been looked for. And it has also been found in globular clusters in the local group here. The, the large points show uh, observations in, uh, in metal poor um, clusters in the large Magellanic cloud. And you see that this anticorrelation is found again. And using integrated uh, light spectra, uh, people like Larsen and collaborators actually also found some indication of, of sodium in a large number of clusters. So here, the, the color points indicate the abundances in, in this uh, uh, local group cluster, in, in these clusters from local group galaxies compared to the mean abundance in, in a Milky Way galaxy. And here you have the small points that actually show field stars. So these, there are some indication of the sodium enrichment also in local group uh, galaxy clusters. So to summarize, uh, there has been some evidence. So it has been found everywhere in all global clusters where it has been looked for. Uh, recently, there has been some evidence uh, through integrated spectroscopy of uh, some variation in, in sodium, although actually these variations are much smaller uh, in the uh, in sm in um, uh, young massive clusters, so with ages down to two giga years, uh, in the in the in the large Magellanic clouds. Uh, here it's summary of where we find it. So here on the top right, so you have as a function of brightness, which is a proxy for mass, uh, as, and as a function of, of age, here you have the global cluster and here you have the open clusters and actually this anticorrelation, it has been found in all the global clusters, but it has never been found in uh, the open clusters. So in this case, the blue points indicate that it's unlikely that this anticorrelation uh, show up. So, um, there has been a derivation of a minimum mass for a star cluster to exhibit this anticorrelation. And this minimum mass, so present day mass of this cluster is of the order of a few 10 to the four. And I just uh, point out here the globular clusters where there is this uh, iron to hydrogen dispersion, as, and you see that they are also, the, they are actually the most massive ones. Uh, so a minimum mass and the second, important point is that uh, the fraction of this, here it's called 
polluted stars, but what I call second population stars, is actually increasing. So it's, it can be derived by looking at the, at the shape and the extension of the oxygen sodium anticorrelation. And you see that this, the number of uh, the fraction of second population stars can be very high, up to 80%, and that it, it increases also with the global cluster mass. So all this indicates that forming this multiple stellar population with this anticorrelation actually requires very extreme conditions in terms of mass and compactness, but it doesn't depend on metallicity because we saw that this anticorrelation was found in globular clusters with over a very range, large range in metallicity. There is another important uh, abundance variation that I would like to point out. It's related to magnesium and aluminum. Uh, so here you can see my aluminum versus magnesium in a, in a number of global clusters. So these are results from the, the Gaia ISO survey. And uh, you see that in most cases, the alumin there are large aluminum variations. And in some cases, you also see some magnesium depletion. So this magnesium aluminum anticorrelation is not seen in all the clusters, but it's seen in the more massive one and uh, the more uh, metal poor globular clusters. So I spoke about helium variation, CN variation, oxygen, sodium, and magnesium aluminum. So now we have to try to understand what is the origin of these, of these variations. And actually, as a, as a nuclear physicist, it's extremely simple. It's just uh, the, the, the uh, result of uh, hot hydrogen burning through CNO, which actually increases nitrogen, decreases oxygen and, and, and carbon. Neon sodium that increases uh, sodium and magnesium aluminum that produces aluminum uh, for, uh, and, and destroy magnesium. So here you have these uh, uh, cycles and chain that are shown. And here I show you the, the actual temperature that you need to reach to make these different, uh, these different steps. And you see that actually, of course, this temperature increases when you go to, to higher, to more massive elements. And actually in order to explain uh, the magnesium depletion, you need to reach very high temperature of the order of 75 million K. So we can ask, but where do we find such very high temperature for hydrogen burning? In this plot, I show you the, the temperature of hydrogen burning in stellar models of different initial masses. And let's focus now only on the red tracks, which actually show you the, the variation in temperature during the main sequence for stars of different masses. Uh, and the first thing to note in this, in this figure is that actually the, the, the low mass star that we observe today in globular clusters that have masses uh, lower than 0 0.8, 0 0.85 solar masses, you see that they have actually hydrogen burning temperature much lower than in the 75 million K which are required. They have actually burning temperature of the order of 25 million K. So this indicates that actually the stars that we see today cannot have made this abundance variation themselves. They have to have inherited it from their birth. So the second population actually has to be born out of protoglobular cluster material that was polluted by hot hydrogen burning ashes of a more massive short-lived first population of stars that I will call the polluters that have actually polluted the environment when these low mass stars that we see today were actually forming. Uh, one thing that I would like to add about this point is that so hydrogen burning at very high temperature is actually uh, destroying uh, light elements like lithium, beryllium, and, and fluorine. Lithium, for example, burns at 2.5 million K, beryllium at, at um, 3.5. So if the low mass star that we see today had formed out of the ed pure ejecta of the polluters, we wouldn't see these light elements in these stars today. However, there are some observations of the presence of, uh, of lithium uh, in these, uh, in these uh, sodium uh, uh, rich stars. And also there is a uh, presence of, of beryllium. So beryllium is one element that is only produced by cosmic crespallation. And there is also some fluorine. So this tells us that actually the hot hydrogen burning ashes that are free of these light elements, they have to have been diluted with the pristine gas that was actually containing these, these, uh, these uh, light elements to make a mixture out of which the second population stars formed. 
So to summarize the, the different uh, nucleosynthesis uh, uh, information that we have, in order to make these abundance anomalies, we, we need to make these, these uh, hot hydrogen burning to have modest area enrichment, as I showed you from photometry, and to mix with protoglobular cluster gas. Another important point is that when you look at stars that have variation in all these elements and you look at their carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, if you do the sum, the sum is always constant. And that means actually that it's only the recycling of hydrogen burning. If you had the recycling of helium burning products, you would see an increase in nitrogen. So you would see actually an increase in, in uh, the total C plus N plus O, which is not seen. So you, you have to recycle only hydrogen burning products and no helium burning products. And as I mentioned before, there are only very rare cases where we see the recycling of supernova ejecta. So in most of the cases, this doesn't happen. So we have uh, all the ingredients now, all the information, and we have to try to find what kind of stars could have polluted the cluster in the very beginning. So to look at that, I will come back to this picture that again shows the hydrogen burning temperature in stars of different masses. And I will actually mention two polluters that have been strong, that have been uh, uh, discussed in the literature. The first one <clears throat> are uh, massive HEB stars, which are shown here in red. And actually you can see that in this case, uh, the hydrogen burning temperature is not reached during the main sequence, which is here in red, but it's, it's reached when the star is on the asymptotic giant branch, when it's under, undergoing the, the thermal pulses. And uh, actually in that case, you have a competition between the third redshift that brings to the surface the, the products of helium burning and hydrogen burning in the, in the envelope, this hot bottom burning that actually destroys the uh, hydrogen. And in that case, because of this competition, the yields from these stars, they are actually producing, they are always producing a correlation between oxygen and sodium. So this is actually a problem because we, we have seen that the, the, the observations show exactly the opposite, that actually it's an, in an anti-correlation that, uh, that we observe. So it's one of the difficulty of these, uh, of, these, uh, of these stars. And another one is that because this hot hydrogen burning uh, arrives very late, it arrives after uh, the second dredge up occurs. And in that case, you also have some increase of the total C plus C plus O, which is also in conflict with these observations. Another difficulty is that these stars actually, they uh, arrive at this phase uh, after the, uh, the first stars have exploded as supernova. So if we don't want to recycle the ejecta of supernovae, we have to expel all the protoglobular cluster star uh, gas, and then to re later to make the dilution which is required, for example, to explain lithium on, or beryllium. So the point in, in that case is that you have to have your cluster which is free of gas when the AGB arrive, uh, well, start polluting the environment. And then this cluster has to find a, 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 another cluster, actually another cloud of gas with exactly the same composition to re-accrete the material through a cooling flow, for example, and to make the anti-correlation. And it's, it's very complicated also to imagine that all the group black clusters actually find a cloud which has the same composition to explain all this. So we think it's, a, it's all these difficulties actually lead to kind of a dead end for these, uh, for these polluters. Another candidate polluters that actually we proposed in Geneva are fast rotating massive stars. So here it stars uh, with masses above 25 solar masses, which actually reach the required temperature where they are on the main sequence. And we imagine a scenario where the stars would actually rotate very fast and would have actually uh, expelled the material in a disk around due to very strong rotation. And in this disk, you could have actually the formation of the second population. We thought it was a nice idea because these stars actually, they would come before the supernova explosion while the pristine gas is still present. So that would be not a problem uh, to explain the, the non-variation of, of iron, for example. Another important nice point was that actually you, you obtain directly the oxygen, sodium and magnesium aluminum anticorrelation and you have no helium burning products. But the difficulty here is that you can see here in, in magenta, 
what is the actual helium variation that you get uh, during this, this evolution? And you can see that very soon on the main sequence, actually, when you reach this very high temperature, you already have produced a lot of helium. So in this case, you would actually, the, the helium variation that you would expect would be much larger than what is found from photometry. So this is also probably uh, a dead end for this, uh, for this scenario. Another difficulty which is common both to the AGB and to the FRMS is the following. If you imagine that the, the stars form with a normal IMF and you use all the material you can expel from these AGB or from the massive stars and you recycle, actually the, the quantity of matter that you have would be just would allow you to form only 10% of stars with the present with the present abundance anomalies, considering that these abundance anomalies are correct. But in terms of quantity of matter, you would form only 10% of these stars. And if, if you remember, actually, we saw that the minimum number uh, fraction of this star is 30%. In, in some cases, it's 80%. So it's really a difficulty. Uh, it's called the mass budget problem. So one idea we had, for example, was to say, OK, let's imagine that the second population forms at the very center of the cluster. And for some reason, there is a loss of gas that also takes away the, the first population that, that is around. And in that case, we would inverse the proportion between first and second population. So the idea was to try to find a way to lose this first population, but we need to lose almost all of them, 95% of them by simultaneous expulsion of gas and, uh, and with these stars. So we did with, with Martin Crowther some, uh, some simulations of super bubble expansion with fee feedback and, and uh, taking into account uh, large scale instabilities. And we showed uh, actually that considering the, the compactness of these clusters, it's impossible to make this uh, very huge uh, change in the mass of the cluster through this uh, supernova explosion, simply because uh, when the supernovae actually, they, they explode one after the other and the amount of energy is released very slowly, much more slowly than the time you, for the bubble to develop the relative low instability. So it, with supernovae, actually, we find that the gas fall back and it's not ejected. So you don't change the potential well of the cluster and you cannot expel the first population. We tried to see if there could, that could work uh, uh, if the gas accretion occurred actually on dark remnant. So uh, after, after the, the end of the supernova explosion where there was, when there was, when there is no more turbulence in the gas. And in that case, we showed that that could work to expel the gas and the first population, but we would have to wait for 50 million years before that happens. And actually came observations of uh, young massive clusters by Bastian and collaborators who showed that actually in young massive star clusters, there is actually no more gas after 5 million years. So we have a contradiction here. Uh, and it's, it's not possible if we want to connect the protoglobular clusters and the young massive star clusters, if we say they are the same object, we have a problem uh, in terms of time scale. So we looked if there could be some extreme star formation efficiency or hypernovae. But at the end, we think that it's it's very not it's probably not the case that the, the cluster can have lost su such a large number of uh, of stars. I would like to emphasize that if it had been the case, then the globular clusters today would have been up to twenty times more massive at birth, which has some consequences for the reionization, for example, and it has also some constraints in uh, in the term of, of field star that we would see uh, from from this that have been ejected from these clusters. And actually, observations of uh, the ratio between halo and, and the global cluster population in dwarf galaxies seem to indicate that it's probably not the correct scenario. So we have this problem of mass budget issue uh, again, common to AGB and, uh, and FRMS or fast rotating massive stars. So one option is to call for non-standard IMF. People usually don't like that too much, but we have been speculating on these on this, uh, on this possibilities for some time. Uh, now I would like to, to come to the last, uh, to the last uh, candidate polluter that has, been, uh, that has been proposed. And I will also explain you uh, how that would work in a, in a large context. 
So a few years ago, the Nisenkov and Hardwick actually looked at the properties of supermassive stars, and in particular to their central temperature. So here on the right, you can see uh, the temperature on the main sequence of, of such speculative stars. So these stars, they were these models, they were computed uh, at constant mass with no accretion, but you can see that actually uh, above a few 10 to the 3 solar masses, the, the hydrogen burning occurs at this, in this range in temperature that we are looking for. And on top of that, that happens when the helium variation is, is very low. So we can expect that actually in that case, we can produce the uh, hot hydrogen burning without producing too much, uh, too much uh, um, uh, helium. And here you can see some plots uh, where uh, Denis Enkoff and collaborators compare the uh, abundances they, they predict. So they take the yields of, of, these, uh, of these stars and they de de of different masses. So here you have three different masses. Uh, so the yields actually would lie on the extreme left where I show the, the, my, my pointer. And actually due to dilution, you do these, uh, these very nice curves that actually reproduce very well the oxygen sodium anticolation, also variation of magnesium and aluminum. And on top of that, uh, that explains very well the, the magnesium isotopes, for example, that you can see on the left. So from the nucleosynthesis point of view, it seems that these, these uh, stars are very interesting. Also, as I mentioned, because they can, they reach this temperature when the enrichment is, is very, in helium is very modest. And this is uh, in agreement with what photometry tells us. So this is for the nucleosynthesis, but we have to try to see how we can form these stars and how that, what implication that has for the mass budget and also for the cluster dynamics uh, um, over the evolution of, of the cluster itself. So I will present you a scenario which is not so new. We, we proposed that with Margulis two years ago, which is related to, these, to the formation of these supermassive stars. So supermassive stars, they are actually kind of popular objects uh, for pop tree or cosmological simulations. They are very, very interesting. And in the case of uh, metal-free environments, they are thought to be formed from the direct monolith monolithic collapse of these uh, no non-metallic clouds. But uh, this collapse occurs only at these, uh, in these metal-free environments, and we saw that the abundance variation need to work at all metallicity. So we had to think about something else. And actually, we looked at uh, this idea uh, that was proposed to form an intermediate mass black hole uh, in, uh, through collision of massive stars in the core of very dense uh, young clusters. So it has, it's something that has been studied by, by different people. And actually, in the previous studies, they found quite large masses for the stars that can form through these uh, collisions, but actually much lower masses than what we expect in terms of nucleosynthesis, as I mentioned before. And uh, the difference between what they did and what I'm going to show you is that actually they considered environments that were not as dense as the protoglobular clusters. So this is what we, we looked at with, with Margulis and others to what happens in the case where you have a very high stellar density uh, and how, how the, the cluster is going to react. So I will show you a very uh, simple schematic view of this cluster. Of course, the reality is much more complicated than that, but we had to make some assumptions to see if the, if the, if the prototype, if the idea was actually could work. So imagine you have a protoglobular cluster, which is still accreting, so in an environment which is still uh, gas rich, and that has formed already a number of, uh, of stars, so pro a number of protostars, which are still accreting. We, so we, we simplify, we make this assumption that you form a certain number of protostars, and then after, during the evolution of the cluster, we form no additional stars. And we start with a protostellar mass function, uh, which is group alike uh, with a peak at point one, and we actually uh, let the stars accrete. And uh, in order to have, after five million years, a mass spectrum, which is similar to what we observe with a peak at point six, uh, which gives us the uh, typical accretion rate that we, we need to have uh, to, to reach these, uh, 
this property. And uh, we assume that after 5 million years, when you start to have stellar feedback by supernovae, etc., the accretion will be halted, will, be, will stop. So what happens in that case? Here you can see the evolution of the in instantaneous total mass in stars. So for example, for different initial number of protostars, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. So if you want to take the 10 to the 6, uh, 1 million stars, protostars at the beginning, you can see the evolution of, the, uh, of this total mass into the stars by doing this very simple math. And uh, what happens next is that uh, when you increase the mass uh, of, the, of, the, of the cluster, actually, uh, the cluster will contract. And here on this plot, you can see the evolution of the half mass radius as a function of time for these different clusters, so with the different initial number of stars. And you can see this uh, very strong contraction, actually, which is proportional to this, uh, to this quantity. And after some time, you see it increasing due to the rel relaxation-driven expansion by binaries that actually dynamically hit the cluster. Uh, so what is important here is that due to this accretion, uh, you have contraction, which occurs, and the stellar density actually strongly increases, especially in the center of the cluster. And very soon, actually, you can have what is called the runaway collision. So in the center of the cluster, you expect to form a supermassive star or actually a very, very massive star, uh, which mass increases through accretion of gas and collision with, with the stars that actually fall into the center due to the contraction. And here on the bottom, you can see the evolution, actually, of this central star uh, for the three cases that I showed before, so 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, and 10 to the 7. And you can see that actually in the case of above a few 10 to the 5, the mass of the central star increases very strongly and actually reaches very high value, which are uh, in the range that we were looking for uh, initially to explain the uh, abundance constraints. So this is a simplistic scenario, and uh, we, we don't know the properties of these supermassive stars. We have to make some assumptions. And uh, actually, to, to build this model, we, we made an, an assumption between the mass uh, and the, the radius of these stars. For this, we took some extrapolation from what is seen from massive stars, and we varied this quantity delta. And this mass radius relation is very important because it's what is going to drive the collision rate with the other stars in the surrounding. So we assume that each time a, this central star has another one that uh, contact, her, uh, contact it at the center, actually it accretes and it, the, the, mass, the mass increases. So this mass radius relation is, is very important. Another important thing is the mass loss of, uh, of such stars. And uh, for this, we also made some, uh, some assumptions and we actually took a mass loss, which, which is uh, uh, an extension of what is observed in uh, the most massive stars known in the in the local group, and actually again we vary uh, this. Uh, with, we have a, a coefficient here to explore the, the different variations. So here you can see uh, the the variations depending on the mass radius relation we use and the mass loss we 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 use. Um, but what is important is not the exact value that we get. What is important is that uh, actually you see that the SMS, so the supermassive stars above 10 to the 3, actually, they form only in the most massive clusters. In this blue curve, you never reach this very high value. And this is directly an, an explanation, it is a direct explanation of why we would see these abundance anomalies only in the more uh, massive globular clusters. So there is a threshold in mass above which you can form these supermassive stars and below that you cannot. If you remember this plot where we, where we, we are seeing the globular clusters and the open clusters, we had this cutoff around a, a few uh, 10 to the 4 present the mass and here we have a value of a few 10 to the 5. Another important point uh, of, this, uh, of this scenario is that actually, um, so here again, I, I plot the, the evolution of the mass of the supermassive star at the center. And here on the bottom, I show you the evolution of the mass that is lost by the supermassive stars. And what happens here is that the star is losing mass, but it's con content, 
instantaneously regenerated by accretion of gas and by new stars that are falling into it. So the mass that the star is going to lose is actually much higher than the maximum mass it can reach. And you see that we, we expel a large quantity of matter. And uh, so this actually overcomes the mass budget problem. We don't need anymore with this scenario to lose the first population mass of stars to account for this ratio between first and, and second population, simply because through this supermassive star that acts as a conveyor belt, actually, we are able to produce a large amount of material to explain the formation, the amount of second population stars. So this is directly related to the scaling also, that the more massive the cluster, the more material we release, so the more uh, material is released by the supermassive stars, the more uh, um, hydrogen uh, burning yields we have to form the second population. So this scaling between the, the mass of the cluster uh, and the fraction of the second population is very well explained also by this, uh, by this scenario. In addition, because you have this constantaneous re rejuvenation, actually you always bring some material which is which has not evolved a lot you are able to to let the star stay uh, at the beginning of the main sequence so with very little helium production and this is also in agreement with what is seen from photometry um, so what happens next so uh, these uh, these supermassive stars they are actually ejecting the material and uh, we think that uh, we we have proposed that actually because the material the gas is still coming there will be some interaction between the inflowing gas and the, the uh, wind ejected by the strong by the, the supermassive star which actually make the deletion that we need to explain the abundances and in particular the, the lithium, for example. So if we manage, if the protostar, which, which are in the cluster, manage to accrete this gas, they will actually uh, uh, increase their mass while increasing the abundance anomalies. So uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's a very schematic, uh, it's a very schematic scenario that needs to be, to be tested and that needs to be uh, tested also for different simulations, but it has, the advantages to, to be able to explain, at least qualitatively, and, and in many cases also quantitatively, uh, the observations. So what are the open questions, actually? So we are speculating about supermassive stars that actually nobody has really seen. Uh, and we would like, actually, to, to see these objects and to try to, to find them uh, in, in different environments. Uh, so my collaborators, uh, especially Fabrice Martin and Daniel Scherer, they looked at what would be the spectra of, these, of such supermassive stars uh, and the superposition of the spectra with the spectra of, of a, an underlying population uh, at high redshift. And they found that we could eventually find uh, these stars through uh, observations of Balmer break in emission. If we were looking at, uh, at protogroup black cluster stars, like the one of, uh, of, uh, identified by Vanzella and collaborators, that could be feasible with a James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, we are presently trying to look for some uh, similar indicators and to search for such stars in, uh, in uh, young massive star clusters uh, from, the Legus, uh, from the Legus data survey. Uh, another possibility would be to look for uh, massive star clusters, which would be still embedded in, in gas with very high inflow rates of the order of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 uh, solar masses per million year, and that could eventually be done with ALMA. And of course, here again, the question is, can we make the connection between these young massive star clusters and the globular clusters? The other open questions is about the, uh, this, the evolution of these supermassive stars. I, we, we made very simple assumptions, actually, but we would like to know how these stars evolve and how they react to different processes like mergers, the shock heating, the different hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamical processes and the mass loss uh, that they would undergo, and also how they would react to different instabilities that they would probably be uh, the, the actor. The actor. Um, so more realistic uh, models for these, uh, for these stars are, are urgently needed. Uh, 
another thing is that our model is is very simplistic it's it's uh, analytic and body but it's not it's not full simulation and we would actually need some hydro and body uh, global cluster evolution models to treat properly the the interactions between the gas the star accretion feedback etc and this is very important of course to to determine the initial mass function of uh, of the clusters and this is very important to constrain the hydro simulation of galaxy formation and of course, as I mentioned, uh, that if we have the initial mass function, we can start to, to know how much these clusters contributed actually to the field. Uh, and uh, and this, is, uh, this is very important. Another open question is how these low mass stars form themselves. So I mentioned the possibility that these proto, -globular, proto uh, stars could actually accrete this material, but it's also something which is which is kind of, of tricky and it's not it's not totally obvious all, all that happens. Uh, I will almost I'm almost finished. I will just mention now if we look at a, a couple of open questions, if we look at the Loma stars that we see today. So if we have actually stars with variation of, of these abundances, their lifetime is, uh, is strongly impacted by the initial helium. So here you can see the, as a function of, of initial helium mass fraction for stars of different masses, you can see the age, the lifetime of on the main sequence, which is color coded here. And you can see that actually a 0.8 solar mass star, which, uh, which was born uh, with a much higher helium has a very short uh, lifetime. So it's very important to, to figure out uh, and to take these, uh, these things into account when we, when we make isochrones, uh, for example, to, to determine the age of the, of the globular clusters and something that has actually never been done yet. Uh, and of course, it's very important since the stars will actually, being more helium rich, they will also be much bluer. So this has some important consequences for the integrated properties of globular clusters further away and also for the early type, for maybe to explain the UV excess in early type galaxies. And there are many other things that I don't have time to, to, to discuss now, but of course we very look forward to have uh, the new generation of instruments on VLT and also ELT to start probing individual stars in massive star clusters uh, in, uh, in uh, external group. So I will finish with this slide. Uh, I hope that, uh, I'm not sure I, I could convince you that our scenario is correct. <laughs> Uh, I'm not even myself very convinced. I just have a couple of pieces of evidence that we, we try to, to put together uh, to build the, 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 uh, an interesting scenario that can, that can explain many things. But we are far away from having understood everything. So uh, taking again this sentence from Eschel, it's probable that uh, we have very little, uh, we, we know very little about the actual infancy, infancy of, these, of these clusters, and we still have many more things to understand. But I hope that I convinced you that global clusters are actually extremely interesting and uh, for, for, many, uh, for many astrophysical questions. And with this, I will thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Charbonnet. And as you say, please uh, make your questions. I will manage to raise your hand. Please uh, press the button reactions in the bottom menu, and then you will find there the raise hand uh, option. So we have uh, the first one by Isabel. Please, Isabel. Uh, hi. So, um, um, thank you very much. It has been a very interesting talk and you have really convinced me of the interest of, I mean, I'm working on extragalactic astronomy, but anyway, I find it extremely important what you're doing and what you've shown us. Um, so what, since I'm working on extragalactic, I've been especially interested in the, in the uh, possibility of uh, searching for uh, ultra massive or very massive uh, uh, stars in external galaxies. Um, so the question is uh, whether you have any kind of prediction of what uh, what features, what special and, and adaptedly um, differential features you will uh, have in, in such stars in galaxies like the ones you are showing right now? 
Yes, so um, it it actually depends on the color of these of these uh, of these uh, supermassive stars. Depending on the accretion rate, they can be very red, uh, very cool, around five uh, five thousand K, or they can be actually uh, very blue. Uh, so it's, it's one uncertainty. And if they are actually very red, uh, Fabrice Martin and Daniel Scherer showed that, that you could eventually uh, look at them uh, through this uh, signature of, of Palmer break uh, emission uh, at high redshift. And uh, they have actually showed some in, in the paper. I'm not a specialist of these aspects, so I won't give you too much details, but I, I, I I encourage you to look at this paper where they show the different features that they superpose to the features of the underlying clusters, actually, mm -hmm. very young clusters with different IMF, et cetera. And they found that if these uh, supermassive stars are red, as we expect when they are actually accreting a lot, they could be found uh, in these, uh, in these uh, high redshift clusters. And uh, if you have questions, I think, uh, both Fabrice and, and Daniel would, would actually answer to this. Okay, th thank you very much. I re reiterate my invitation to... to <laughs> thank you, person. thank you. I will come for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Isabel. Then we have another question by Emilio. Oh, mm, thank you, Corinne, for this uh, challenging talk. In fact, it's very, it's very inspiring, but there is Thank a you. lot of information yes. that uh, I had to, you know, to, to, to digest <laughs> before that. But, uh, yes. but uh, my question is, uh, okay, so if I understand in the right way, this uh, uh, very supermassive, supermassive star will also explode as hypernova some way, no? It's so yeah, so uh, I, I would I would say we, we actually don't know. It it could be so. There has been some studies that actually they would be they would be uh, they would undergo some different instabilities that might dissolve them very early on. Uh, some re um, relativistic instabilities and different hydrodynamic instabilities. So it could be that actually they, they dissolve uh, very quickly. And in the paper with Margilis, we, sh we looked if there would be a possibility uh, to actually form several of them one after the other. And uh, we showed that could work uh, in, in the case of the most massive clusters where actually you could dissolve it and you could uh, reform one. So we, we, we don't know. The, the point is that, um, I am more a nuclear astrophysicist, and, and for me, it's really the abundances that are actually driving uh, mm. the, 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 the idea. And, and we really have to, to so it's, it's clear now that from photometry, there is very little helium variation. Uh -huh. uh, and and uh, there is nothing else. So there is no helium products which are recycled. Yeah. So it's, it's very complicated to find something that makes hot hydrogen burning with very little helium and nothing else. So no, no helium burning produce is recycled. It could be that it's recycled, but then the second population don't accrete this material. Yeah. But, but overall actually, or that this material is released when the gas is gone, but, but we, we have to recycle only these hydrogen burning products. It's, it's very, very difficult. And it's, it's really this nuclear synthesis that drives all these ideas, actually. It's, it's, uh, so you, you, you really have a very small footprint. Uh, it's like this, uh, this uh, image of the dinosaur where you find the, the very small footprint. And you imagine this gigantesque uh, dinosaur, this monster behind that has made this footprint. And we are kind of in the same situation here. The, foot, the footprint is a nuclear physics. It's also, we also have this question about the mass budget. We know how much material we need because it's not, I mean, it's not only a few stars, it's the majority of the population. So we need a lot of material. So this, yeah. uh, so this is what drives this supermassive star idea. But you will, if you look at the paper with Gilles, it's quite a long paper. And I think half of the paper is more question than answers. So all this at, at the end, I went very fast about the open questions, but there are many, many aspects for which we know we are far from reality and we, we, we are working on X, you know, and, and, uh, but, uh, but I think it's the only, and, and I'm not, I mean, 
if you saw, I, I spoke about this fast rotating massive star scenario. I was very excited 10 years ago when we proposed that. And at some point we had to, to say, okay, it doesn't work. So it's not because it's my scenario or it's Margile's scenario that yeah. I'm very yeah, happy, yeah. but it's just to say, okay, if we take all this information, that's the only thing we have, but it doesn't mean it's, it's the truth. Uh, maybe we need to be more imaginative or I don't know, it's, it's, it's very tricky. But, uh, but I always remember this, uh, this uh, message by uh, David Arnett who was saying that it's, uh, it's the uh, isotopic ratio that actually keep the theoretician honest. And uh, I'm playing this game, you know, with, with these abundances, we have this nucleosynthesis behind and that's what drives these, uh, these very crazy and uh, exotic scenarios. Well, I, I was thinking a lot, you know, in, 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 in the sense that, uh, uh, for example, uh, if some kind of this supermassive star is blow up hypernova, you would expect a lot of gamma emission. So how do you introduce this ingredient in your scenario? So it's uh, happened nothing. It's uh, something like the Redis has not a very important interaction with the uh, gas remnant on the gas, what is still forming a star, or, or you know, there is a dynamically some uh, injection of energy and momentum that yeah. uh, is producing something. No, I don't know. Yes, yes. Well, well. Yeah, I'm again, I'm not a specialist. I'm really stellar physicist, nuclear, blah, 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 but I'm not really a specialist of this question. So it, it's very interesting. And, and I think we, we, we should think about, about this, this thing. The, the, the trick is that you, if, if you input some energy uh, when there is the gas, then you can change the potential well and you can make uh, variation, you can make the, the, the cluster inflate and, and, and evolve. If it happens when the gas is gone, you, then the effect is much lower. So uh, again, here we, again, we take assumptions. We say there is accretion until 5 million years and let's see what happens. So we, we played here to see what, is, what are the actual conditions, the most favorable conditions where that would happen. And, uh, and this is what we find, but we, we don't say it's reality. It's, um, so, but this ga gamma emission, I, I will actually uh, try to think about it and, and would be happy to continue to discuss that eventually with you later. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you, Emilio. And we have another question by Rosa. Please go on. Hello, Corinne. This is oh, Rosa. Press with your talk. It was Thank you. very interesting. Um, a lot of information that, uh, in fact, I, I'm not, uh, I understand all of them. <laughs> um, well, I, when you were talking about the different possibility of the polluters, I was thinking that maybe the fast rotator were, could be a solution because I was remembered that we did a, a, a work a long time ago uh, about the superstar cluster 5069, where they are combining, where we found that they are combining the feature for world Raja star and also the feature for calcium triplet. So as indicator that there is a, in fact two uh, stellar population um, in the in this super star cluster. Um, uh, later, it was found that in fact it was spatially resolved the, the cluster and um, there is some um, uh, uh, with a very small separation where you can identify the, the possible two population. But according with the, the, the last proposal uh, the, uh, for the polluter um, related with this supermassive star, in that case, you don't find, um, I expected that you will not find a difference um, if you study the, the radially the, the, the abundance of the, of the star in the, in the globular cluster in the case that were possible. So, so you, the, point, yeah. the point is, are, there is any way also in relation with the possible uh, spatial variation within the cluster uh, to see which is the the, 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 the best uh, 
uh, uh, candidate as yes. the polluter or the best scenario for to explain the this uh, um, uh, variation of the abundance from cluster yes. to cluster? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I must say, I, I haven't looked at the literature about this specific point recently, uh, but uh, what I have in mind is that actually in some clusters, people looked at the, the uh, radial variation of these abundances in different clusters. And in some cases, they found there was a trend, and in the other case, they found the opposite trend. And it was not, so it was really depending on the, on the from one cluster to the other. And I think it was also related to the dynamical state of the of the of the clusters. Uh, the, so it, maybe I'm wrong because uh, again, as I said, for a couple of months I didn't look at the literature, and maybe with Gaia now there has been some inf additional information, but there was no strong evidence of of any uh, uh, strong trend uh, for for this. Uh, relation between the position and the abundance properties. And uh, people like uh, Olga Baumgart, for example, mentioned that there is a lot of dynamical evolution that can also, that has a time for uh, 10 giga year to, to modify also the, the dynamics of the, of the clusters. So it's not, it's not totally obvious if we could still see that, but, uh, but I, yes. I'm, I'm not really sure about that. There is no definitive clue for the moment, but it, it can be interesting to, to look at it, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, in the, if I may add something, so in the case of supermassive star, everything should happen at the center because uh, of this uh, runaway collision and, and the mass segregation. In the case of the fast rotating massive stars, we were thinking that it should also happen in the center for the following reason is that in that case, we have the mass budget problem. So we have to form the, the second population at the center and then to expel the gas and the first population. And in that case, we would like them to be in the, in the surroundings. So here there would be some segregation, but does it stay while the cluster evolves for 10 giga year? It's not, uh, it's not obvious. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Um, I do not see any more questions. So if not, we will thank again, Professor Charbonnel, please, for this uh, marvelous talk. And uh, hope we, we can see you here in Granada next time. Yes, I hope to. And uh, thank you very much again for the invitation. It was nice to see some old friends also uh, here. And uh, and uh, I wish you all the best. Take care and uh, and see you see you soon. Thank you. You soon. Salute.